Scott Oswald, I'm the creative director of the MIT Education Arcade, but I'm turning the floor over to Vivek Bald, who's our director of graduate studies, and he'll be doing the introduction. So for today's colloquium. Great. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, so it's it's my great pleasure to introduce Laura Partain tonight. Um, Laura is a visiting lecturer in, in our department in comparative media Hello. studies this year, uh, specifically in civic and global media. One second. Um, so uh, Laura is a, a media effects scholar whose work focuses on understanding the complex uh, the complex news and social media effects on marginalized communities' access to sociopolitical material and medical resources. Her scholarship is located at the interstices of citizenship status and national belonging. Laura's research uses experimental analyses to develop media interventions for prejudice reduction and focuses on the media effects of racial, religious, and ethnic identity representations. Laura has worked with communities in Syria, the occupied Palestinian territories, Lebanon, and Iran, but also works with these communities uh, who are forcibly displaced in diaspora, that is refugees and asylum seekers, as well as with Arab and Muslim Americans more broadly. Her training in critical study is in critical studies um, and uh, her use of interview and survey method methods grounds her work within these communities' experiences while necessarily considering these communities in relation to geopolitics and other transnational solidarity movements. She is a PhD candidate in Indiana University's Media School, holds an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Texas, Austin, and graduated with a BA in Religious Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Laura is also a fellow in the Muslim Women and the Media Institute through a Henry Luce grant at UC Davis. And I'm going to hand it over to Laura. Welcome. I said, great, thank you so much, Vivek. <laughs> uh, can I go ahead and share my screen now so that I can um, launch right into my PowerPoint? Wonderful. Okay, so I'm now screen sharing. And there we go. Can everyone see? Is every everything good? Okay, so I have a lot to get through. Um, there may be certain points where I kind of briefly touch on the slides and then move on. Uh, if you have any questions about what I've um, moved on from quickly or skipped over entirely, uh, please feel free to ask me about those slides or that information in the Q&A session. Uh, so this project that I'm going to be discussing today is called Dynamic Exchanges. Um, and yeah, it. so this project um, really uh, came out of the 2015-2016 presidential election cycle um, and um, the rhetoric that occurred during that uh, election cycle, but also very much so the policies and the facilitation of certain policies um, that happened once uh, Donald Trump was elected to president, right? So um, one of the first things that Donald Trump uh, did when, uh, after his election to the presidency, was he put out Executive Order 13769. And uh, this order um, effectively banned uh, com uh, communities from Muslim majority countries. And um, this is why it became known as the quote unquote Muslim ban. And it became known as this primarily because it seemingly um, inconsistently and randomly um, selected certain countries uh, to be banned from entrance to the United States while allowing other Muslim majority countries to still have access to um, immigration or, or uh, to visit the United States. So the goal of this was, um, according to the White House, to protect the nation from foreign, foreign terrorist entry into the United States. Um, so uh, along with this order, um, very shortly thereafter, uh, Donald Trump also talked um, a lot about the preferred immigrants or desired immigrants um, that he would like to come to the United States. Um, and he would always, or he put those in a um, binary between 
the shithole countries, um, which he most commonly talked about, for example, like Haiti or other countries on the African continent, and then Norway. Um, and so he, he really created this binary between them that the only conceivable way to understand the binary was through a lens of race. Um, and uh, this comment or this um, dialogue um, that he started on these countries uh, was followed up by his immigration or his head of immigration, Kevin Cuccinelli, um, giving us a rewrite on the uh, Statue of Liberty's uh, kind of infamous um, uh, symbolism uh, in that he said, uh, she really should be saying, give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. Uh, so um, with this uh, kind of whole set of rhetoric coming out um, and the public charge um, order being put in place. Uh, this resulted in a number of uh, on the ground um, effects for certain marginalized communities such that uh, especially immigrants um, became nervous and um, in some instances would try to take their children off like their health care because they would be worried that that would disqualify them from being able to have access to permanent residency or to get a green card. Um, this had uh, additional effects on their access to food stamps, cash assistance, public housing programs. And right now, um, we can see the way that this rhetoric and subsequently the policies that came out of this rhetoric have had repercussions for these communities, uh, specifically immigrant communities, um, uh, those who are undocumented, but also those who are, for example, asylum seekers. And um, it, it has kind of created this freeze on them not knowing whether they could or could not seek uh, healthcare assistance um, for COVID or during um, the, the, pan the period of the pandemic. Um, and um, a, a immigration um, websites in the U.S. have taken to putting um, a lot more information up online uh, that uh, tries to assure people that they can seek assistance. But I'm bringing this up because of um, uh, the way that my work in particular uh, at this stage is seeking to really analyze the immediate um, rhetorical effects on audiences and to then be able to take that information and see how it translates into public policy and then uh, kind of dictates or um, restricts certain uh, access to resources. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. So um, we are, most of us are probably quite familiar with the rhetoric that uh, occurred during um, the election cycle. Uh, these images represent some of the rhetoric that was used to discuss Syrian refugees, um, ranging from Ben Carson uh, saying that re Syrian refugees were like a rabid dog um, to the very frequently used idea that Syrian refugees were acting as a Trojan horse um, for ISIS. Um, and so this type of rhetoric was very common um, and even still, uh, kind of perpetuates the discourse on Syrian refugees. Um, there also, uh, so while there was not necessarily as much discourse on Palestinians um, in this last election cycle, there has historically um, been quite a bit of discourse that has fundamentally excluded the voices of Palestinians um, as well as uh, ignored um, some of their um, some of their demands or desires um, for self-determination uh, during presidential debates. Um, and even though Donald Trump did not discuss Palestinians um, or really as much Israel during his presidential election cycle, um, since he uh, took office, he has moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv in Israel to Jerusalem. And he's also uh, put out the deal of the century, um, along with his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, that again, uh, did not seek the input of any Palestinian voices and by and large um, ignored or uh, inappropriately addressed um, historical uh, conditions for Palestinians, uh, some sort of Palestinian uh, peace deal with Israel. So this research then um, that I'm presenting to you today is called Dynamic Exchanges, 
uh, because as I've demonstrated briefly already, but um, what I wanna hit home today is that when a news media object or a news media product or a media product in general is put out, that there isn't just one instance or one site of consumption that happens. That oftentimes what we see is that something is put out in the media and then you have a certain audience who consumes that and then that audience may react to that object or product um, in their consumption and then reproduce it again for other people to consume or respond to. So what happens is you typically have this cycle of different sites of production, consumption, and then reproduction. And all of these impact uh, the rhetoric that, uh, that immigrants, that um, Middle Eastern and Arab communities navigate every day. Uh, and I just briefly want to point out that I do use um, the phrase Middle Eastern. There are also other phrases um, that some people that are somewhat contentious. Uh, I know that Middle Eastern, for example, um, to some people, they see it as a reflection of uh, colonial discourse. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the terms we use are imperfect. And uh, but for the sake of being able to have this discussion and refer to a specific area today, I'm going to use um, Middle Eastern. Uh, so um, I will be talking about uh, the cycle that I'm referring to um, and the question that I developed to um, address this cycle is what are the news media effects of presidential rhetoric and policy at different sites of a media cycle. Um, so I'll address this through an experiment that I conducted. Uh, this experiment was with native born um, US citizens who um, turned out to be about 87% white. Um, then I conducted a survey with uh, Palestinian and Syrian, Amer Syrian Americans. Um, and uh, in that survey, I presented to them the results of the experiment as well as um, sought their feedback on the original news object. And then I also conducted interviews um, uh, with uh, Syrian Americans and Palestinian American artists uh, to get a better in-depth look at uh, some of the responses to um, the media ecosphere and to, to better understand um, the types of production or artistry that they put out um, in light of uh, in light of the rhetoric. So uh, I'm going to give a brief project introduction. So this project examines established differences in the U.S. historical narrative that privilege legible otherness, often represented through assumed visual markers. Differences such as race and nationality contribute to in-group and out-group stereotypes that mobilize political and social marginalization. Despite the supposed coherency of in-group and out-group divisions, this project raises research questions that examines degrees of such divisions, creating a comparative analysis between communities that are often subsumed into the single category of Middle Eastern, Arab, or Muslim. This work offers a complicated look into the embeddedness of ideological messages about race, religion, and national belonging within US culture. Seemingly incoherent, my results on race, nationality, and religion are decipherable through a lens of whiteness that uphold historical systems of oppression. I assess these results through a framework of what my research has constructed as a quote unquote politics of gratitude, which I term as a set of extrajudicial expectations that native born US citizens or native born citizens place on a um, immigrant or refugee. Using this construct to demonstrate how the figure of the Arab and forced migrant disrupt, disrupt established hierarchies in US social space and how US religion and racial systems are two integral points through which subsequent marginalization occurs. So some of the relevant theories that I use throughout my research um, of which I uh, previously had kind of interspersed throughout uh, my slides, but I realized that it would be best just to put it at the beginning so everyone can kind of understand where I'm going with some of this. Um, so I use something called social identity theory, and I, I talked a lot about in my introduction um, in groups and out groups and social identity in theory uh, really informs the ways that we um, informs the process of how we construct or why we construct those in groups and out groups. So this theory is premised on the idea that in, our individuals desire to have a positive self concept concept and manage or improve their self esteem accordingly. There are negative or positive attributes associated with varying social group categories, and these associations are relevant to one's own self-concept. So when one has an in-group and one has an out-group, 
um, there are going to be uh, different um, ideas that are attributed to one group versus the other group. And the idea here is that those concepts or those attributions uh, can be um, uh, that it affects the way that one sees oneself and one sees one's in-group, right? So third, social groups are not inherently positive or negative, but accrue these evaluations based on comparisons to other social groups. So the idea really is that we all want to have a positive self-concept and therefore we want to have our group that we, the groups that we belong to have a positive um, construct as well. Um, I also talk about something that is not technically called museumization, but I label it as such. Um, it's from Chakrabarti, uh, and he discusses the way that whiteness establishes itself as the authoritative voice in teleological global development. And um, this is really uh, necessary for my, for my work in thinking about ideas of progress or liberalism um, and how uh, within this construct, um, communities such as from the Middle East are always put as always already behind um, and failing to live up to a set of expectations uh, because of, of this design um, in development. So I also use um, theories on whiteness to really inform my work. And um, whiteness uh, defined by BAB is a system of privileges accorded to those with white skin. Um, uh, importantly, Dyer says that it's not just epidermal markers of a vague otherness. This is not a direct quote. Um, it's not just epidermal, epidermal markers of a vague otherness. Outward markings of difference um, came to stand in for a symbolic negation of whiteness. Uh, that is immoral, irrational, unintelligent, inhumane, and unchanging. Um, and these uh, constitute whiteness through the very absence of European designated spiritual or intellectual integrity. So um, according to Yancey, the intentional dehistoric dehistoricization of whiteness veiled its composition as natural rather than as aspirational, and subsequently reordered the ontological and epistemological ways of knowing morality, intellectualism, and rationalism. So by fundamentally devaluing indigenous knowledge that included spiritual modes of discovery and analysis, scientific rationalism decidedly positioned alternative ways of knowing as outside the very boundaries of rational thought itself. The schematics of this institution were self-sustaining. If, by a system that white ruling classes created, indigenous and black communities were naturally less intelligent, rational, and moral, then these same communities were always already precluded from disputing the very validity of racial science that legitimized equivocations of whiteness with prosperity. And these ideas are going to become really relevant as we move into understanding some of the results um, of the experiment that I am about to present. So my experimental research uh, was presented to uh, participants as a news story. Um, and this is an example down here of how it was presented. Um, there were different uh, hosts or different um, news anchors. There were different images and representations so as to reduce potential bias towards a single image. Um, it was represented here as a news story and represented to participants as coming straight from the news. Um, although later it was corrected to inform participants that indeed these stories represent kind of an amalgamation of different news stories about Syrian refugees or um, Palestinian refugees, but that they actually, uh, they, this wasn't like a direct or, or an actual story that had happened. So um, I, my experiment was a three level um, experiment. Uh, I use something called moral mappings of which I'm not going to get too in depth into. Um, but this comes from uh, something called moral foundations theory, which is um, predicated on the idea that there are a finite, essentially a finite amount of um, moral foundations or outlooks uh, that influence the way that um, people see the world and the way that they interact with the world. So for example, um, um, I, I took these ideas and then I matched them with presidential rhetoric um, that occurred during the presidential election cycle. Um, and so if a, if a candidate talked a lot about 
police or talked a lot about um, the military, for example, uh, that would reflect an idea of authority subversion and that was uh, maybe would be used there. So then um, another manipulation set of manipulations um, are nationalities. So I manipulated whether people received um, a condition with um, a Palestinian story, a Syrian story, or a Norwegian story. Um, and I also manipulated um, racial phenotype as well. So um, accompanying every story that the people received, um, they would receive two images, one with presidential rhetoric and one with a story about a um, refugee or immigrant family trying to resettle in the US. Um, Every story would have um, one either one image either of a Syrian family um, with a lighter phenotype or with a darker phenotype. So the categories of hypotheses that I looked at pertain to rhetoric, nationality, and race, as um, can be reflected in the experimental design. Um, I measured um, participants' emotional reactions, their expectations, as well as their specific attitudes towards refugees and immigrants. I went through, um, I collected a lot of demographic data, and I ran this experiment. If anyone who's in quantitative studies is interested, I ran it um, as a single model with um, the three manipulations, as well as the participants' own religious affiliations. So for some of the demographic results, um, when I conducted this, I did allow people to select really like 27 from 27 different religious variables. Um, so for example, Jewish denominations were broken up into, you know, Orthodox, conservative or reformed Jewish. Um, but uh, by and large, um, almost everyone concentrated in these three categories, which were um, I, I recoded to be kind of an atheist, agnostic, non-religious. There were very few participants in the Jewish denomination, but I thought it was important to keep that. And then also I had Christian denominations. Racially, um, it was, again, like I said, predominantly um, made up of white participants. Um, the education level, people were fairly highly educated who participated in this, but we also had a kind of a nice spread of people from different um, educational backgrounds. Uh, also a fairly nice spread in terms of age, although once again, uh, we ha I had mostly a younger, a set of younger people taking this. Um, uh, in terms of nationalism, um, we, I had, uh, again, fairly high levels of people who held nationalist ideas um, participate in this study. And then for their political identities, um, it was about a two to one ratio of people who were Democrat taking this. Um, and then quite a few people who didn't support any political parties, which I was a little surprised by, but maybe I shouldn't be um, quite as much given the current um, state of politics. So um, some of the results that I found, which these really are some of the results, because I, I want to note that um, I was examining quite a few things and I did find results for the moral manipulations, as well as things more pertaining to the nationality of the um, refugees, but by and large, the results that I found or the results that I'm presenting, which make up the core of the analysis, um, have to do with race and um, the religion of the uh, people who took the experiment. So um, for uh, kind of a breakdown, um, there were a lot of positive reactions um, when people received the darker phenotype representation, such that they were more likely to believe that this refugee story was reliable or truthful. They were more likely to believe that the US should welcome refugees and immigrants in general. Um, they held significantly higher levels of feelings, like feeling disturbed over US policies demonizing refugees and immigrants. Um, I almost reach a level of significance, but um, this is still an important finding that um, people who received darker phenotype representations uh, were almost more likely to support the assertion that people have a right to flee their homes of origin. Um, they were more likely to support refugee and immigrant resettlement. They felt sadder for the refugee families in the story, and they also held significantly higher feelings of acceptance um, towards the refugee, the refugee family. People who received the lighter phenotype um, representations were um, more likely to agree with the statement that white Muslims are less violent than brown Muslims because they are still culturally more similar to the West. Um, they were less like if they received the lighter phenotype versus the darker phenotype, 
they were less likely to agree with the statement that it would be foolish for Muslims to demand access to all levels of society, um, which once again, the flip side of that is that people who received the darker phenotype were statistically more likely um, to believe that Muslims, that it was foolish for them to demand equality to all aspects of society. Um, those who received the lighter phenotype also um, believed they could recognize um, a Muslim by their physical appearance alone. And they're almost less likely to hold neoliberal expectations, which are a set of um, uh, expectations that have to do with public or like reliance on um, certain government support um, for refugees and immigrants. So, right, so even though I have more things to get through, just as a summary, what we can kind of see here for the racial, for when people received um, the darker phenotype representation, by and large, they had more of an, an altruistic or a sympathetic response to the uh, refugee family and towards immigrants and refugees in general. Um, when they received the lighter phenotype representation, people were more likely to display anti-Muslim racism attitudes um, and to uh, kind of show more of a preference for um, lighter phenotype uh, or have higher, better, more nicer, if you will, uh, views towards lighter phenotype um, refugees and immigrants. In terms of the religion's effects, um, uh, what I found was were mostly differences between um, Christians and, and the group that is um, agnostic or atheist or non-religious. Um, and so, um, uh, and, you know, just for anyone, again, who uh, runs statistics or is interested in the quantitative aspect of this, I did run po post hoc analyses to ensure that there were significant differences between those two groups and that it wasn't just something thrown off by there being a smaller um, group of uh, the Jewish community participating in the survey. So this is mostly comparing um, the Christian groups and the um, non-religious groups. So that means that Christians were less likely to believe that immigrants and refugees had a right to challenge US policies. Um, they uh, uh, were less likely to believe that immigrants and refugees should have input on their treatment. Um, they were less likely to support resettlement in general and they were less likely to be disturbed over negative rhetoric about these communities. They are more likely to believe there, sh there should be higher legal standards for immigrants and refugees. They are more likely to support an English requirement prior to resettlement. They are more likely to hold anti-Muslim racist sentiment. And they also were more likely to hold higher expectations that refugees and immigrants assimilate, have positive feelings or attitudes, um, and for them to not rely on US aid or resources. Uh, Christians were also believed that they could spot a Muslim by physical appearance alone. And they also thought it was foolish for Muslims to have access to all uh, levels of society. Um, additionally, participants who believed that whose faith was more important to them, who believed the U.S. should welcome all faiths equally, and who also believed that the U.S. is a unique safe haven for Christians and Jews, overall had less positive views towards immigrants and refugees held higher expectations for immigrants and refugees and were less likely to report or to support resettlement. So we can kind of see even within this that people simultaneously believed that the US does welcome all faiths equally, but then at the same time also believes that the US is a unique safe haven for um, uh, Christians and Jews, right? And, and so we kind of see uh, there being a wrench thrown into some of the, these ideas or, or these worldviews. So then how do we explain these seemingly contradictory results where we have a situation um, where, uh, where people seem to have a nicer or more positive view of lighter phenotype refugees and immigrants, but also really would prefer to have um, darker phenotype refugees and immigrants be resettled. How do we kind of rationalize this idea that Christian communities are, um, that in the U.S. historically, a lot of Christian communities have been the ones who are leading um, the way to have refugees resettled or who um, find homes for refugees, but then also you have a situation where they are the ones who have 
the least positive view um, between Jewish, Christian, and non-religious communities in the U.S. towards these groups. So we can kind of, we can understand this best if we understand it through a lens of Arab American history, right? So until the 1960s, Arab Americans were not considered European white, but they also were not deemed as antithetical to whiteness itself, nor did they threaten the ideological integrity of the U.S. racial system. Uh, uh, interviews that were done with Arab Americans in around the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s uh, have shown that some Arab Americans actually thought they were perceived as a model minority. Um, and the racedness that is the race put on these communities um, living in the U.S. really fluctuated over time depending on the needs of whiteness to discipline U.S. citizens and incoming immigrants. So Arab Americans avoided being wholly raced in the U.S. not because they were unidentifiable as an other. Indeed, many Arab Americans were included in categories along with Ottoman Turks, Greeks, Italians, and other Mediterranean groups based on the context and at a time when these other groups were not yet subsumed into categories of whiteness. They were not yet raced because the history of Arab American immigration coincided with moments when they were permitted or sometimes demanded of to assimilate into normative cultural definitions of whiteness. Although this points to the very fluidity of the U.S. racial episteme itself, Arab Americans racial adaptability has been a product of their adjacency to whiteness, whereby this community at times was able to legislate their own identities in a way that African or indigenous Americans, for example, could not. Despite whiteness's affordances to Arab American communities, their subject position was always determined through white intermediaries, rendering their racial identities both subjective and often very precarious for these communities. So the reason that Syrian and Palestinian Arabs in particular avoided rigorous racial identification until the 20th century derives from shifting immigration policies that aim to keep as many quote unquote undesirable immigrants out of the United States as possible. And we can see this because um, if we're looking, I pulled up this map to hopefully be a little bit of a help to us. Um, so uh, this is early Arab immigration to the US and sorry, I'm moving my clicker around so you can see it. So early Lebanese, Syrian and Palestinian immigrants to the US were referred to by and large as Syrians. Um, this was due to uh, this whole area um, and many often being referred to as Al Shams. Um, and US citizens uh, would just call them all Syrians because they didn't really understand the complexity of the region. But within this area of Al Shams, we see um, like here is um, Syria, here is Jordan, there is Palestine. Sorry, I'm trying to look. Um, and Lebanon, I'm trying to see where it's listed. I believe it's right here. So um, what happened was the inability for people to recognize some of the differences led them to just be altogether categorized in the U.S. as Syrian for some time, right? The first large-scale immigration um, to the U.S. occurred between the 1880s and 1920s, uh, but it's important to note here that um, as Alexa Naff, or Alexa Naff has demonstrated in her fantastic and really foundational work on Arab American communities as that um, individual Arabs had actually been uh, traveling and, and immigrating to the U.S. or traveling back and forth between the U.S. and, and their country of origin really for several hundreds of years, for several hundred years before that. So around that time we had a number of immigration restrictions which I wish I could get into. I don't have time to go over all of them. Um, but there was the Naturalization Act of 1790, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, in 1889, that's when the U.S. began using race specifically as an additional um, immigration category to screen entrance into the U.S. There was the 1917 Immigration Act and then also the Johnson Reed Act of 1924. And then there were additional immigration acts after that to either consolidate um, previous immigration acts or to um, change them. Uh, right. So. Um, they, so Arab Americans did not avoid the early stages of specifically racialized violence in the U.S. because white Americans were benevolent towards this group, but instead because whiteness as an ideology benefited from categorizing Arabs as temporary citizens of whiteness. For example, Arab Americans have historically acted as a boundary line between whiteness and otherness, often stemming from their unique identities. 
Um, Arabs um, have historically been uh, had a higher socio been part of a higher socioeconomic um, group. They are predominantly middle class or wealthy landowners and entrepreneurs. Um, religiously, uh, Arabs before World War II were 95% um, Christian, actually. And uh, racially, um, they were able to, once again, litigate their, their whiteness in courts. So as becomes clear, the confluence of racial, religious, and presumed cultural identities have resulted in a contemporary system whereby Arab whiteness veils systemic inequalities that this community faces, prevents Arab access to resources designated for marginalized communities, and renders Arabs as threatening because of their ability to assimilate. So if Arabs mark the limitations of whiteness, Asian communities have historically precipitating or precipitated uh, the hardening of racial boundaries. And we can see that through um, some of the cases on litigation that occurred in the earlier 1900s. Um, one of the uh, first ones was for Costa George Najur. Um, he, um, he had lived in the US for a long time, but because of an earlier, um, uh, earlier acts that said that uh, Chinese Americans could not be naturalized. Um, he was forced to litigate his whiteness um, and, and prove that he was, quote unquote, not Asiatic. And then in another case in 1910, Tom Ellis um, also had to try to litigate his whiteness in court. And it's important to remember that during this period, judges would use a, would fluctuate in what types of um, uh, rationale they would use for why someone was or was not white, um, whether it be the visual representation or it be scientific racism, um, addition, in addition to other categories. And so for Tom Ellis, he had to, he was on the borderline and what um, allowed the judge to rule in his favor was that he spoke English, which was an example of his literacy, but also that he was Christian, which therefore implied that he had good moral character. Um, so what these what this demonstrates is there um, oftentimes that race is unstable over time, but by and large that um, when Arabs are able to litigate their whiteness, they did so at the expense and, and by the same logic um, that really held up white supremacy at the time. Um, also, again, this does not necessarily mean um, that they always benefited from this. Rather, they were often perceived uh, by the wider public um, uh, not to not be white. And there were also, for example, uh, situations or cases where Arab Americans were lynched as well. So they did not necessarily receive any sort of positive treatment just because they were able to quote unquote litigate their whiteness. Okay, so um, uh, Arabs really stood in the middle of these discussions on racial identification. Their national identities position them as belonging to the Asian continent, but their phenotypic variation, predominantly Christian identities, and economic fit with contemporary American capitalist um, values were in opposition to common stereotypes about Asian communities. That Arabs were visibly recognized as not indigenous or um, indigenous American or black but not commonly accepted as white led to various attempts to litigate their whiteness to claim its privileges, as we talked about. Um, so uh, Arab Americans also, hold on, let me, here we go. Arab Americans also relied on Christian faith practices to establish their whiteness in US legal proceedings. And this reaffirms kind of the complex mutual dependency of national and ethnic origins and religious affiliation that historically constituted race as natural rather than a construct. Although explicit mention of race, uh, sorry, of religion is often elided from conversations on race, scholars and whiteness studies diligently unearth the role that religion symbolically and materially held in the violent disenfranchisement of racially marked marginalized communities in America. Scholars target the 1700s and 1800s as a period where codification of racial hierarchies in the US took hold. So scholarship examines how the groundwork for race hierarchies has been in place for centuries that Christians brought a tradition of the binary of black and white moral dualism to bear on an enemy um, that could be perceived as black. So the Crusades were thus part, um, according to Dyer, of a heightening awareness of skin color differences, which they further inflected in terms of moral attributes. So what we see here is that over time, and specifically in the United States, uh, Christianity had worked to uphold racial binaries 
between whiteness, which was um, associated with ideas of purity, uh, morality, holiness, um, and these same values that were used to uh, rationalize um, slaveholding in the United States were similarly also used uh, as a way to perpetuate um, taking over or um, the genocide of indigenous Americans, as well as US imperialism abroad. So really, um, in, in the US, um, Arab Americans were perceived as white by and large until the quote unquote question of Palestine in the 1960s, um, when there were uh, increasing wars um, between um, Israel and Palestinians and, and the other surrounding um, Arab countries. Uh, and um, between the Cold War, when um, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans became kind of the new boogeyman, and um, in post 9-11 America, uh, we, we saw again kind of the reification of the binary between, or the perceived binary between Christian and Muslim communities in the US. So for further information, I'd um, recommend these books, which are fantastic on Arab immigration, um, Arab Americans race, um, and immigration in general. So some of the takeaway results from this experiment are really that these results unveil a system of participant belief whereby darker phenotype refugees are more recognizable as victims. These experiment tests are not examining whether people feel sympathy overall, but they're really based on um, the differences uh, between when people received a darker phenotype image or lighter phenotype image. So um, we, we found that, um, or I found that uh, by and large, those who uh, are the participants in the study held more altruistic views towards darker phenotype refugees. And this evidence really supports an explanation whereby the belief that lighter phenotype individuals possess inherent character traits that predisposes them to success and that failure to live up to the success is a personal rather than systemic condition. For example, I found that there were higher expectations that were placed on lighter phenotype, or lighter phenotype Norwegians and darker phenotype Syrians. So while um, there were higher expectations for darker phenotype Syrians, higher expectations were placed on lighter phenotype Norwegians because of the supposed um, racial in-group, out-group um, differences. So here, the US racial hierarchy really disciplines immigrants and refugees into perceived appropriate roles for these communities. And traits like language, racial phenotype, or cultural presentation are used to mark certain communities as the other, and therefore requiring additional surveillance. So for white Christian citizens, survival is then predicated on being able to essentialize the other. And here, essentializing um, the other reinforces sameness. So without persisting categories or categorization of outgroups as possessing inherent similarities, whiteness really risks the weakening of its ideology of supremacy through Middle Eastern and Muslim communities, perpetually demonstrating cultural, religious, linguistic, and political differences. So even though um, uh, there was more sympathy for darker phenotype uh, refugees. This is also potentially because they are markedly the other and therefore do not really disrupt systems or coherent systems of racial hierarchies. Um, so I'll go through the survey quite quickly here. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I took these experimental results then and I presented them to um, a uh, participant pool of Syrian Americans and um, Palestinian Americans. Um, but before I did that, I actually presented um, these groups with the exact same uh, news story. And I also presented them, um, so with the news story and then a set of questions for the news story. And then I presented them with the results from the experiment. So, um, uh, I asked them a set of demographic questions. We had about 46 participants, which is a fairly small demo or a fairly small pool of participants. Um, but we had a really um, a nice uh, spread of people with different religious beliefs between non-religious atheists. Um, we had um, Sunni Muslim and then a variety of um, Christian denominations. Um, these communities uh, were from all over the globe, were born in different places. Um, they also held uh, very national or ethnic identities. Um, some of the other results that I found is that these communities by and large felt really connected to their ethnic and or national communities. 
um, that uh, they spent a lot of time practicing, or they spent most of their time relating to their community through practicing an artistic activity. Um, but they also connected to their communities through other religious activities or political um, and general social activities. And that um, Palestinian and Syrian Americans use social media very often to represent themselves um, or represent their national or ethnic identities. And that when they did so, they were most likely to use Facebook and then Twitter. Um, so I had um, a pretty uh, solid amount of people who identified this was a self-identification, so people were able to enter in or select multiple racial identities, um, as well as enter in other ones that they thought better um, represented themselves. So they, um, a lot, or self-selected brown as a racial identity or white as a racial identity. And because I had a smaller um, participant pool, I then recoded these into, um, even though these names are not quite like what I would like them to be. Um, I had to recode them into people who identified as white only, and then people who identified as um, multiple identities or in some way identified as white in addition to other um, racial or ethnic identities. So I didn't find, importantly, um, when I used uh, race as a mode of stratification to understand the results from the survey, um, I didn't find any differences according to race in how people participated in activities. There was no difference in their connections to their identities or connections to others in the community. Um, there was no difference in how they identified in terms of their citizenship status, whether it be immigrant, asylum seeker, or um, otherwise. Uh, there also was no difference in terms of how people identified racially and in, in how they um, identified religiously or whether they were born inside and outside the United States. And this is important because these could be explanatory um, mechanisms for what I found. Because what I did find is that for participants who identified as white only, they participated in fewer religious activities, but they also held higher expectations for the immigrant and refugee family that was in the news story. So they were more likely, or they, um, they held feelings that they expected the uh, refugee and immigrants to be um, grateful to the United States for letting them in or that they should leave. They also expected them to be happy and have feelings of happiness and general feelings of gratitude, right? And they were also less likely to agree with the statement that immigrants and refugees should have input regarding U.S. policies and treatment of immigrants and refugees. But at the same time, when I presented the survey participants with the results from the experimental study, which as a reminder, was primarily was native born US citizens who 87% um, of whom are white, the participants uh, who, um, the survey participants who identified as white only and were more critical of immigrants and refugees and held higher expectations of them, they rejected the experimental results or negative views on their communities at the same rate as people who didn't identify as white only. So some of the takeaways from this are that um, uh, we can understand, or that to understand racial identity and social identity theory, it really should be complicated by power structures and understanding that, um, that social identities may actually fluctuate depending on who you, uh, on the information you receive or who is uh, at a time per, again, or perhaps against your in-group. Right, and I've also, um, a takeaway would be that internalized whiteness may be an important lens with which to understand contemporary racial and social politics among marginalized communities. So I think I have like 10 minutes, five minutes. Does anyone know, Vivek? Do I still have a few minutes to go over the interview portion? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, um, okay. take, take the time that you need. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so the last section, oh, the last section then um, are the interviews. Uh, and these interviews um, were conducted with Syrian and Palestinian artists, six different artists over about 19 hours um, of talk time. Uh, and, um, I use something called grounded theory to assess these um, or to analyze these interviews. 
uh, and uh, grounded theory in this case really centered the um, interviewee's own um, experiences and, 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 and their demonstration of how their experiential reality uh, itself is pedagogical and um, uh, it's, it's really useful in also breaking down some of the historical barriers between uh, the academy and the quote unquote real world, if you will. Um, so I used Robin G.G. Kelly's work to kind of guide that grounded theory. And my research question um, uh, for this was how does the contemporary U.S. news media ecology affect Syrian American and Palestinian American artistry? So the artist, um, uh, the first one is Amel Kassir. She's pictured right here. She's a Syrian American woman from Denver, Colorado. Um, she's a poet, a spoken word artist, a teacher. Uh, she's known for um, her TED Talk. She's performed at the Kennedy Center. She was also a uh, recently representative to the UN International Women's Day on behalf of tortured Syrian women. Uh, the next artist is Basil El Madani. He is a Syrian American man from Kent, Ohio. He is a soul and funk musician, as well as a logistics expert, consultant, manager. Um, he really, yeah, all of these artists, it's an, it, I want to um, comment on how they all had multiple jobs and needed to have multiple jobs, but they all had multiple jobs they spent a lot of their time on. Um, and I was really grateful for them to take the time out to talk to me. Um, so he's known for being the lead singer for Basil and the Supernaturals, um, and they have performed at many a music venue, including South by Southwest. Um, I also talked to Tarek Luthun. He's a Palestinian American man from Detroit, Michigan. He is a poet, community organizer, um, and a data analyst. He's known for, he won a regional Emmy Award. He's also advised on major um, uh, political campaigns in Michigan and has been the face of a lot of um, acti local activism in Michigan. Uh, so one of the other artists is DJ Fatten. Um, she's a Palestinian American woman from Brooklyn, uh, New York. She is a DJ and activist, um, and she's known for being the quote unquote a uh, female Palestinian DJ, a title or a label which she kind of rejects but also appreciates for its sentiment. Um, she's performed at the Kennedy Center. She's been uh, invited to perform at embassies. Uh, she's, she's known globally um, for her DJ, DJing. Um, the next person is Sia Ghazala. He's the one who um, painted this um, mural. He's a Palestinian American man from Dearborn, Michigan in San Francisco, California. He grew up between both uh, communities, so he identifies as coming from both. Um, he's a visual artist who paints murals, um, paintings, digital art and clothing, uh, among other forms of art. He's known for some of his commissioned art around San Francisco, the US, even around the globe. Um, and he's also known for his uh, Oakland Pal Palestine Solidarity mural. Uh, the last person that I interviewed was Samuel Bain. He is my Lebanese, Syrian, Palestinian, Italian interviewee from San Francisco, California. Yes, he identifies very much with all four, so we didn't limit, you know. Um, and he is both a comedian, a host. He does like 50 jobs. It's amazing. He's known for, um, he was one of the hosts on the Netflix show, The 100 Humans. Um, he's been on America's Got Talent, Conan. The last comic standing and he's known for his performance of literally a thousand and one nights of comedy in a row. I don't know how he kept that up. So I talked to them a lot about their experiences um, with uh, producing art and, and, and producing um, important cultural products uh, in light of or during um, a time when uh, the news media sphere and news and media in general um, produce not quite so kind or, um, ideas or rhetoric about these communities. And so Tarek's, or Tarek's thoughts on this were really um, important and useful. And so uh, I wanted to read his thoughts um, rather than kind of outlining um, a whole theory of my own here. So I think that's also what's been difficult about being Palestinian, about being a person of color. Often, you know, you're always asked, well, how bad is your oppression really? It's like you can't point to one moment that was racist. I'm like, I'm always living under it. It's like I'm always seeing it. I wake up every day knowing that my family back home has limited resources and limited access to healthcare, has limited freedom, right? 
So like I wake up every day knowing this. So when we talk about media portrayals, there isn't one single media moment that I feel like impacts me. They all weigh me down to a greater and greater extent with every passing moment. And so long as we're not free, I will always be weighed down whether I see it or not. You know, like whether I see it or not, I know the perception. I understand the way in which media has contributed or been complacent and complicit in the portrayal of my people. So there isn't one moment, there isn't like one time, but I can say that it definitely frustrates me. It definitely makes you want to, it makes you feel like you're going crazy because like here you, you can see tangible things that you believe and know are true. And yet an entire population of people thinks that your truth is not real. And so this was a sentiment that was expressed widely among the participants, the idea that um, the, the media and, and here most often referring to American media gaslit them and um, made them feel like what they were seeing, what they were experiencing wasn't really what the reality was. And so this was something that a lot of them um, worked through or that they were, they were um, that was weighing down on them while they were presenting their um, work to me and while they were creating their, uh, their art every day. So um, uh, when I was looking at this as an entire body of interviews, um, you know, I, I worked with people from really varied backgrounds who were in different artistic mediums. Um, but really what struck me was that all of them enacted what I um, termed preservation, which is a form of collective memory. Um, so their work is adjacent to, news to a news media landscape that both excludes Palestinian and Syrian self-representation. It's important to note here that I, in my work, don't conflate Palestinian and Syrian identities or conflate pal Palestinian and Syrian experiences. They are quite different. However, um, there, are not, there are cultural similarities and there's also a lot of solidarity work between these communities um, that um, led me to um, put these into a comparative analysis. So their artists work in acts processes of pro preservation through collective memory building via social media and in-person platforms um, through um, a coherent body of work that is neither stagnant nor actively dissipating. Um, there's the recognition of historical erasure. They maintain critical identity constructs in diaspora and they use their geographical distance to build more protected infrastructures of representation in ways that some of the communities at, um, in, in their, um, the ethnic identities that they identify with, um, the ways that they might be unable to at certain times. Um, this also extends post-memory literature into a future orientation. So this is necessarily predicated on a group's experiential reality of an existential threat to their identity. So such a threat motivates the art to act as both a carrier of aesthetic experience as well as a museum of historical reference. Um, Basil talks about this when he um, discusses uh, videos of footage of ISIS and he said, it's like the last thing that represents Syrian people is Daesh. And yeah, in fact, like they, they like, these are the people who are working actively to erase the memory of Syrian culture, who are actively destroying well-preserved ruins from the beginning of time to create their own dynasty and whatever. And yet these are the people we're attaching Syrians. People think of Syria. This is one, is one of the first things that comes to mind. And so Basel really um, critiqued the uh, perpetuation um, that, um, especially recently in the news, that always rhetorically connects ISIS with Syrian communities. Um, while, um, so they both kind of fetishize this connection while also hollow out Syrian historical and cultural identity that is very rich and very different from anything relating to ISIS. Um, and Tarek said, we're not fighting to just be free of occupation, we're fighting, we're fighting to amplify these beautiful components of the culture that do not get heard because of the occupation, right? Like it's a different angle by which to take this. It's not, oh, we want to stop being killed. It's, oh, we want to live. And um, this idea was really, um, um, was at the forefront of what Tarek talked about because of the really common phrase that Palestinians like, ex um, uh, exist to resist, and he, and he brought up what happens when we are no longer having to resist? What happens when we then live in a, in a place where we have some sort of self-determination? We want to have a society where we can uh, be able to bring our expertise or our, you know, education really to the forefront. 
So the idea with these people is that um, the artists are preserving traditional cultural values and practices within contemporary work that can be altered, reimagined, or imported into future um, communities. So um, this was also, uh, our conversations were often marked by references to 9-11 and how this had a, a, an effect on their own self-conception of their identities, whether it was one of the um, artists recalled an incident where his teacher in the classroom um, jokingly told him to not use an Uzi to shoot up the classroom. Um, but we also have like someone like Sammy talking about how 9-11 really, um, it wasn't that he didn't know at all that he was Arab American before, but it was after 9-11 that he began to understand what being Arab American meant within a US, um, within a US uh, space. So there, I don't wanna go too much longer here because I want to get questions. Um, but I do, I'll, I'll briefly go over some of this, um, that there are, uh, I talk about three specific modes of preservation um, uh, from these interviews, and they're having to do with form, tradition, and relationships. And in terms of form, a great example was DJ Fatten. Um, uh, she often performed for um, both um, within Palestinian communities, but also within the wider Muslim communities in her area. And she saw it as really a service to the community um, because a lot of the um, traditional celebrations, like for weddings, uh, a lot of times there was a need for a woman to be able to um, play music or entertain at these cultural events. And so she was able in, in, this, in these instances to preserve some of the cultural tradition in terms of music or um, the celebrations themselves, but also start to bring in kind of more um, egalitarian views about women in the service industry. So I talk about with this with other um, artists like Chris as well. Um, there was a lot of talk about food and land. Chris made a comment that I just, or Si Ghazala made a comment that I just love, which is I may not have grown up speaking fluent Arabic, but we ate fluent Arabic, you know. Um, and uh, Amel uh, reflected on this when she said that, um, you know, she was talking about the differences between Syrian and Palestinian tabula, for example. Um, so uh, food is often a really important um, holder of memories. It has an effect, affective and also material um, relationship between the people and, and their, um, their, uh, their wider communities. Um, uh, see Ghazala or Chris talked about how the mint from his grandmother's garden um, allowed him for when he arrived in um, Israel, his actually uh, U.S. neighbors who, ha who also had Israeli citizenship picked um, uh, Chris up from the airport and how when he looked down and saw mint that it reminded him of home, it reminded him of his Palestinian grandma's mint um, that she, the garden that she had kind of recreated in the U.S. Um, so I would love to go over this poem. Um, I just want to, I don't have time to read over it, but this is Amal's Food and Land poem, and it is incredibly powerful and moving. I would really recommend um, going and looking up my grandmother's farm. And she talks about the role of food in, um, in, in persisting through the, um, the current, uh, the, the war in Syria and um, thinking about having to rebuild after the war. And I just got rid of my video. <laughs> um, so I also talk about textiles such as tetris, the kefiye for both Syrians and Palestinians, as well as the importance of flags in their work. Um, I talk about relationships um, having to do with religion, which was really important, particularly for, for Amel, who um, talked about the, the way in which uh, the war in Syria really um, reconstituted certain relationships having to do with faith among Syrian communities, um, as well as for Palestinians and the relationship between um, Palestinian and or Christian and Muslim Palestinians. Um, I also talked about intergenerational relationships and how this really comes into a lot of their work and preserving certain, um, certain traditions and understanding family structures, but also trying to um, also kind of that tension between uh, first and second generation and third generation um, immigrants in a, in a different country, trying to kind of hold on to um, some of these traditions while also um, progressing in a certain way. So I talked about, um, uh, I'm only going to briefly go over this. 
um, race and preservation um, through instances of solidarity. This was really important for a lot of the artists um, because uh, they've been called racial slurs, but many of them also grew up um, among other um, communities of color uh, where they felt like they belonged much more so than in, in, the, in white communities. And so there were, um, they grew up with these solidarity, solidarities with them, um, but also uh, all of them spoke to the importance of having, of um, uh, carrying out solidarity work um, um, as part of their work with their own community. So in conclusion, um, some of the, the, the summaries that whiteness is an ideology in contemporary US Christian rhetoric uphold racial hierarchy in the US as pertains to Arab immigrants and refugees. Um, there uh, is seemingly internalized whiteness among Arab Americans and identifying with whiteness as an ideology rather than a phenotype um, is highly correlated with negative views towards incoming Arab refugees and immigrants. Um, I also found that Arab content creators are aware of media messages, their effects, and they take steps to preserve their historical traditions while also anticipating a complex and generative future in which this idea of um, being able to quote unquote practice and being able to um, uh, have a very thorough knowledge of their relationship to, to tradition uh, will allow um, the, the carrying on of those uh, within the more egalitarian space in the future. And I have several other projects underway um, right now that look at interventions into biases and stereotypes. And I think most importantly, in going back and connecting this to the beginning, is that they also look at, um, I'm, I'm starting a project that looks on how immigration policies in, like, in particular um, can have uh, impacts on um, Arabs and, and Iranians, for example. Um, so I'm not gonna go over anything else. I am just going to stop here. So I'm going to, Okay. Have I unshared my screen? Thank you. No. Uh, oh, okay. Let me yeah. stop share. Okay. There we go. Great. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm, uh, I have a, a bunch of questions and I'm just going to ask one to start things off and, and then um, let others jump in. Um, and that was, uh, it, it relates to um, the the final section of, of your presentation just now um, about the various different artists that you interviewed. And um, so the way that you um, described their work um, in, in, in one of the slides was that it existed adjacent to the kinds of um, media representations, negative media representations um, that um, your your more uh, quantitative work uh, addresses, um, and and you talked about the, the um, those artists seeing, or, or you spoke about the artist's work in terms of preservation, mm -hmm. and and I'm just wondering whether um, in your interviews with the artists whether um, how, whether they characterize their their work as as uh, challenges to um, the like broad media uh, stereotypes of, of um, Arabs and Muslims, um, in which case the audience would be uh, a, a broad audience as well, right? Sort of like engaging with those stereotypes on the larger realm of popular culture and media um, versus um, working to the, the, the kind of preservation work that you're describing um, in some ways implies a, a kind of um, an audience of others within the same or connected communities and, and kind of building a certain kind of strength from below, right? As yeah. opposed to using their media work, you know, cultural and media work as a, 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 a way of, of combating stereotypes on this larger stage. So, yeah, I'm wondering about those two kind of modes of media politics or cultural politics and, and how they're articulated by the artists you spoke to. Great. Thank you. That's a, yeah, a really important question. And um, 
it actually, so first to address whether or not they themselves addressed media stereotypes or who their audience was, I think is, is really what we're getting at here. And it was split down the middle for the most part. Um, I will say that really a, a, particularly Palestinian Americans were not speaking to a different outside audience. They were not trying to um, uh, combat certain stereotypes. Uh, for the most part, those uh, Palestinian Americans were instead um, really kind of more focused within their own community, but with the hope and with the um, additional, the, the goal would be that other communities could, you know, view their work, witness their work, see their work, um, and then um, have some sort of way to kind of uh, have access to this conversation. Whereas really the Syrian American um, artists that I spoke with were much more kind of outward looking in, in, in terms of who their audience was. So they mostly were trying to either represent Syrian Americans, Syrians in general, um, uh, to um, audiences that were not of their own communities. Um, so they were speaking to their communities, they were speaking in solidarity, but by and large, um, uh, they were trying to kind of enact a type of educational experience um, for, uh, for people in the US or, or um, globally. And um, so that is part of the first question and I'm trying to remember, so that then part of that also gets into um, being adjacent to the media. And I think that that's, um, I use that very carefully because oftentimes um, there is the <laughs> kind of overdetermination of the word resistance. And I think we often like to attribute um, that everything that communities who have been marginalized or oppressed in some way, um, that everything they do is resistance. But I think to some extent that also then serves to recenter um, those narratives that are harming their communities. And so they exist in the space where they acknowledge that these occur, they know it, it's weighing down on them, but I think that for the most part, they are trying to create um, um, objects or trying to speak in such a way that they can uh, show unity with their people, that they can, um, um, whether it be showing them something beautiful or whether it be showing them something that they can relate to when they're walking down the street, um, that those communities are, um, that they're, they're just trying to connect with them. They're not necessarily trying to combat a specific media stereotype. Was there, can you remind me, was there another? No, that, no, you covered everything that I asked, asked about. That's great. Thank you. Um, so there, uh, uh, why don't we see, uh, there are a couple of questions that have come up in the Q and A, um, but also I wanted to just see if anyone immediately um, has a question, Emily? Yeah, thank you. And Laura, thanks very much for the wonderful presentation. Very comprehensive. Um, so I had a question about your earlier quantitative media effects um, research. You were talking about how um, participants who identified as white only often held the assumption or the, the belief that um, immigrants and refugee communities needed to um, kind of act happy or uh, kind of present gratitude for being in the U.S. or else they should leave. Um, and that reminded me of uh, in econ the lump of labor fallacy, which um, is that like immigrants coming in only really take up jobs and don't also create demand for jobs. Um, so I was wondering whether you've seen in your own research or other research um, whether being presented with information about how immigrants contribute in various ways to communities or the economy whether like by, you know, accelerating innovation or paying taxes or taking jobs that um, citizens often don't want to take, uh, I, it sort of attenuates those feelings that they need to be grateful or act happy. Just sort of thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you, Emily. That's a fantastic question. I, I kind of work along that line of research and in, in other things that I do as well. And um, I, I did measure in terms, um, so, so what you're talking about um, is something that I sometimes 
deem respectability politics, um, which when it comes to refugees and immigrants can mean that um, there has to be a narrative that these communities contribute most often fiscally to a uh, United States economy in order to be um, worth it or, or to be uh, deserving of, of, of being able to come into the United States. And so you walk this really tight rope between acknowledging that you're, that really Arab, Amer or, um, Arab communities and Iranian communities in the United States actually do, um, they are known for their entrepreneurial <laughs> um, um, capabilities. They have been to be on a, some more of the middle class, to even upper class in terms of immigrants in general. And um, they're highly educated. We see a lot of um, Arab Americans um, also becoming physicians. So they do occupy this place. But on the flip side of that, that same rhetoric then can also serve to limit who is allowed to come into the United States. And that's what we've also seen with this new par public charge rule and with subsequent um, quotas put on um, on, on immigrant communities that really limit how many communities can just be able to be accepted into the United States for just being a refugee. And so um, there, there is the extent to which um, like Humans of New York, um, Honey has, you know, ran a great series on Syrian refugees a few years ago. And so things like that do have the capability to somewhat humanize or, or um, bring positive information about a group to the wider public. But then you also have situations where um, I had, a, or I completed a study on all of the uh, news reports about um, uh, the executive order that I talked about in the beginning that prevented um, Muslim or communities from Muslim majority countries from entering into the United States. And I found that most of those stories for the exceptions or people that really should be let in, that it typically focused on the military or it focused on um, uh, people who were um, families that were split up. And so what really happened were communities who well, they're escaping war, they're, they're fleeing violence, um, that that wasn't deemed as a important enough exception to, to um, be granted asylum, for example, or be granted an exception. So that is something that's been studied a lot. And, and it, it's really hard to find the balance of using that type of information to humanize and really broaden knowledge about these communities, but also not reinforce something that is harmful to these communities in the first place, which is this idea of respectability. So did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. I think so. Um, Ambar. Hi, Laura, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question, like in the last part you talk about intergenerational relationships, and I was wondering how do you think like media narratives can generate uh, disparities in these relationships if you think they can how they can um you mean how they can kind of complicate the intergenerational relation yeah so interestingly i think i had it on my slide i didn't get to it but almost every person referenced rami the show rami which um he uh you know he's he's won now right a golden a golden globe for an emmy for the show it's a very, it's a widely popular show and it's, it's about um, uh, um, a man who's Egyptian American and he kind of has to deal with balancing all of the, this like intergenerational expectations um, and understanding what it really means to be Egyptian American in the United States at this particular time um, and kind of carrying all the, to some extent, the burden of what the family expects of him and cultural and traditional values while also trying to um, fit in or be part of uh, US society. So I think um, what I've seen, and I, I don't know if I can speak to shows as a whole, but I, I'll use this as an example, that I've seen um, a lot of Arab Americans really relate to it. And I think it's, um, it's something that there, there have been criticisms on it that maybe that Remy doesn't always present a really complicated narrative about women. Um, and I think that he did a better job with that in the second season. But what I've seen by and large is that people 
feel like they're being seen or feel like this idea of being in this liminal space of caught between two cultures where they are feeling pulls from different generations that is something that they can relate to and also it almost gives them like not just a language to use when speaking to friends but it's almost something like they see it and then they can talk to a friend and they're like, oh, you saw that. Like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. And I think we see that a lot too increasingly with like YouTube videos that there's a lot of, um, you know, first, second, third generation immigrants creating YouTube channels and, and being like, and kind of showing this tension. And so I think that it can be really productive um, for, um, for second, third generation immigrants or refugees or asylum seekers who, um, maybe realize that other people have these experiences, but I think that there's a lot of attention around it. And I think even the portrayal of it is that it's not, it doesn't always have to be frustrating either, that at certain points it can be kind of funny or it can create really um, uh, beautiful moments between generations where they, they can have a space to come together. So um, I think, I mean, I love Remy. I think that other shows that are, are um, similar, um, like even Jane the Virgin is a really nice example too, um, that they can be really um, useful and helpful for people to have conversations on topics where they might not know where to start otherwise. Um, I'm gonna take a couple of the questions that have come in um, on chat and in our Q&A. Um, and uh, the first was um, earlier on, Susanna, who's one of our uh, alum, um, mm -hmm asks, uh, what does the concept of a unique safe haven for Christians and or Jews in a discourse with American Christians mean? Uh, she says, that confused me. Christianity is the world's predominant religion, right? Is there some implication that Christians are persecuted globally? The answer is yes, there is the perception among American Christians and specifically evangelical Christians that Christians are persecuted globally. Um, and this has been something that has really, I would say has really um, intensified since perhaps the 1980s um, and, and the increasing rise of some of the, like for example, um, Liberty University, Jerry Falwell Jr. Um, uh, in, in the last um, presidential election, we saw that Christians were quite upset that um, um, uh, President Obama uh, brought in Syrian Muslims and they just couldn't understand why he would be bringing in Syrian Muslims to the United States who are refugees because they were like, oh, well, ISIS is, is also Muslim, right? And, and so without understanding some of these really complicated nuances um, and, and showing up and, and, and wondering why there wasn't a preference for Syrian Christians to be um, resettled over Syrian Muslims. So um, there, there is this notion that uh, Christians are persecuted globally, that they are increasingly being persecuted and targeted in the United States. We've seen this also with the idea of the war on Christmas, um, for example. And so a lot of evangelical um, Christian commentary or rhetoric does uh, kind of construct the U.S. as a safe haven, as some sort of unique place, which really does also kind of um, harken back to earlier Christian communities, whether they, in the 1900s, 1800s, that viewed the U.S. as a new Israel to Christians and for this community. And so this unique safe haven for Christians and Jews also comes out of um, a lot of my findings that have shown that Christians really believe that they are much more similar and related to um, and hold the same values as um, American Jews, for example, than they do um, American Muslims. And so um, for many American Christians, there has been this kind of division where they see it even, they call it um, Judeo-Christian belief systems. Um, and and that Muslims do not fit into that narrative. And so measuring that was more so a measure of um, kind of this, this rhetoric that uh, situ or has a situation where Christians are perceived to be um, globally persecuted more than other faiths at the moment, or that they're being um, increasingly persecuted, and that in the US there's a risk of losing uh, personal freedoms. So that's really where that came out of, um, kind of this idea of isolationism, uh, nationalism, 
um, but also some of these, these um, binaries between Christians and other religious communities. So I don't know if that answers the question, Susanna. Um, that's a that's a great question and definitely needs explanation. So okay, great, great. Um, so uh, I'll take another uh, question from this is from Q and A from from our uh, attendees, and this is from uh, Kimia Jalalipur. And the question is, could you expand on why you think the internalization of white ideology may occur among Arab Americans or other marginalized communities? Yeah, thank you, Kimya, for that question. Um, that is a great question. Um, in my mind, the internalization of whiteness does come from uh, what we've seen originated with the litigation of whiteness um, in the earlier um, 1900s and this pressure to um, either assimilate or adopt certain practices that align with whiteness so as to avoid um, marginalization. And so over time, the weight of avoiding margin or trying to avoid um, certain instances of marginalization has in some uh, cases resulted um, with that that internalization of whiteness as an ideology uh, in order to um, uh, potentially avoid um, experiencing um, negative consequences that other marginalized communities may experience, or really that they've been so socialized into this white ideology that it's something that is part of their, um, their uh, worldview or part of who they are just as a person growing up in the US. So I think there may be a number of reasons for this, and I think that would have to be something that would be studied with a much, much larger um, participant pool as well. Thank you. Um, uh, there are there are a couple more Q and A questions, but I thought I would bring it back to um, see if there are any questions from uh, our graduate students. Is it possible? Let me just um, mm -hmm. throw up. Oh, you can't see my. I unshared it. Um, if anyone is interested in asking me some of those questions, uh, you can always email me them at alpartain at mit.edu. Sorry, go ahead. My apologies for that for interrupting. No, no problems. Um, uh, so I'm, I'll go to another uh, Q&A question. Um, and that is from Hamid Reza Nasiri. Um, and uh, who writes, there is this issue of looking at refugees by either being kind to them or rejecting them, while the root cause of having of of having been refugees is ignored. So when we have Syrian or Honduran refugees, there is that binary perspective, but little conversation on the significant impact of US interventions in those places in causing mass migrations. The 2009 coup in Honduras um, or the role of the US inciting war in Syria are not discussed. Uh, so the question is, I'm curious, if you ask your interviewees not just about their sympathy or openness, um, but about their responsibility toward refugees for the wrongdoings of their own government. And then I think he, he follows it up with, to clarify, I'm asking about the surveys from US citizens especially, but also maybe how the artists think about that issue. Thank you. Right. Um, Hamid Reza, thank you so much for that. Um, that is a such an important um, question that really, uh, gets at the heart of a lot of which what I do, which is trying to um, be able to uh, bring to light not only some of the underlying colonialist or imperialist policies uh, that further demonize these communities um, and also, um, but they also in many ways contribute to the displacement in the first place. So I think that is something that um, very much uh, needs to be looked into in, in this current work, I did not look into that, but I think that is actually a really fantastic way to go forward in a different direction would be to get some of these, um, would be to get reactions from participants if it's reframed instead of something that these communities are fleeing from, you know, you know, usually the, um, the uh, event or the, the instance from which they are fleeing is often uh, you know, 
it's, it's unrooted or unmoored from its origin, right? And so it just happens. That's what oftentimes these like events are, are, are just seen to happen or it just happens over there because of their history or their identities. And so I think that um, it would be really interesting to bring that to participants to um, maybe instead frame it to them as their accountability and being and being part of a democracy that has democratically elected representatives who do have some influence over um, US policies abroad. So um, I didn't ask them about that. I, um, the artists that I talked with, um, we did have many conversations and understanding the uh, political relationships between the US and um, different governments around the world. So, so that is something that we talked about quite a bit. But um, I really love this question. I, um, gosh, I need to conduct another uh, experiment with this question. So thank you so much. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go back to our, our group online here to see if there are any other questions. And there's one more in the Q&A that I can get to as well. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go back over to the, the Q&A and Laura, you can probably, you see this too, right? So the question is, does the editorial position slash makeup of the U.S. media matter? <laughs> In other words, do you, um, oh, do you, I, I guess, it, do you show the same story presented by Al, Al Jazeera, Fox News, and MSNBC? Oh, do you think it must be, there's a missing word, but. Yeah. Um, would generate differing results if shown to the same control audience? Okay, that is a good question. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, the first question seems a little bit different from the rest of it, even though I, I think they are related. Um, I do think that the editorial position, or I do think that the um, that it, it matters who is presenting these stories. I think that even what I found with my survey participants is the criticism that by and large um, conversations on their communities did not come from the communities themselves. They were not rooted in, in the historical demands or goals of the communities themselves. So I think that um, the representation and um, uh, in all levels of media and media production is absolutely um, necessary, relevant, and does have an effect on the types of stories that are being put out. Um, in terms of do, do I think the same, I think you're asking if I think the same story presented on different news stations would generate different results. And the answer is yes, I do. Um, which is why I used the same, I used I believe, ABC, I think, um, for that. Um, I didn't use Fox News or MSNBC on purpose. I didn't use Al Jazeera on purpose um, because very much what we can see with, um, with uh, politics right now in this country is that polarization doesn't only just occur, occur from what's being said, but really from the source that's saying it. And um, so I think that uh, right now with ideas of fake news or legitimacy, that it, it was important for me to keep the news um, station the same uh, because um, in that experiment, I didn't manipulate the news station. So in the future, that would definitely be something, and I'm sure that other people have manipulated news stations and other experiments. Um, my experiment would have gotten too big, but yeah, the answer is yes. I, I think that's a great, great point, and it, it would affect, I think, um, participants' views. All right, well, we've gone over time, but... Um, uh, Okay, I'm just waiting to see if any any other questions are there. I have more questions, but we'll have to do that offline at some point. So um, thank you so much. Um, that was really a wonderful talk. And, um, and we um, look forward to hearing within our own community here, hearing more about your work and, and um, uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Vivek. Thank you to everyone uh, who's here today. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.